everyone, it's Vicky here and in this tutorial we're going to look at two functions that are so useful that everyone should learn them as soon as possible. These are BBOX and Centroid VEX functions. They'll help us easily set up optimized simulation volume boundaries, use sublevel geometries for force centers and many many more. We'll also look at a neat workflow for setting up your simulation bounding boxes, so you never ever have to worry about them again. Let's get to it. So here I'm using Houdini version 19.5, but you can use any Houdini version, it will work everywhere. So here I have a very simple example, so just a pick head, then a transform node with a sign function in X, Y and Z axis. And this is just to make it move and then make sure you have a real time toggle switched on and now you can preview this movement. So that's it, that's all it does. So now just make sure you display the null and I will select this example and use the emit particle fluid from the particle fluids tab. And this is just so that we have something to work with. And let's just hover over the viewport. You can see it asks us for the object to emit into, but there are none. So I will just press enter. And now you can see we have this huge bounding box and it's definitely too big for our simulation. So if I play it, you can see it's quite slow and it also needs to calculate all that space around here. And of course I can adjust it manually, but then you see this pick head is moving quite a lot. So I would need to check all the farthest points in each axis and then adjust this bounding box accordingly. So instead of doing that, I will actually do something different. So I will go back to my example. Okay, here we go. So the pick head, let me zoom in and now I will use a trail node. And the trail node can be used for several things. Most of all, we will use it to compute velocity and we did it in the bubbles tutorial, but now we'll actually use the preserve original option. So now when I plug it in and display it, you can see it duplicated my pick head geometry. And then if I move to frame farther away, let me just make sure I don't see that. You can see I always have the current frame and the previous frame for that geometry. And I can actually adjust the trail length. And when I increase it, you can see I have more copies of the geometry. So it creates a trail of that pick head movement. And what I can do here is take my length, this, this frame range length, and create a trail for everywhere this pick head goes. So what I will do here, of course, I could calculate how many frames I have here, but I will go to the last frame and then I will use dollar sign F and to bring in my last frame of my frame range and subtract dollar sign F start. So the start frame of my frame range. And this will give me my frame range. So 99 frames and also 99 copies for each frame, one copy. If I want to, maybe I can add a few more just to have a bit more information. I will leave all the other options as they are. And now let's scroll the timeline and you can see it's a bit slower now. Okay, so for each frame, it's showing me my current frame plus 99 frames previous to my current frame. What I can also do here is evaluate within frame range. When I tick it, it will show me only the frames, the position from the start to my current position. So you can see that it's growing as the pick head moves. So what I want to do now is drop down a time shift note, and this will allow me to freeze this stage on the last frame. So in other words, I will see the whole movement of my pick head throughout my timeline. So I will go to the time shift and I will right click on the frame and delete channel. So now it will always be on frame on the last frame. Okay. Or you can set it manually over here. So in my case, it's frame 1100. So you can see I scrubbed the timeline, but nothing changes here, which is great. What I will do now, is use a bound node, which we also discussed a few tutorials ago. 
So now we can see it creates a geometry that this geometry fits nicely inside. And what I can do here is add some padding. So this is my geometry. That's the bounding box. So I can add some padding to each side to make it slightly bigger. Here we go. So now it would be nice to use this as our bounding region in our simulation. So if I go back to my simulation and it will be uh, a bit different place for each simulation, but the idea is the same. So for flip inside the flip solver, you can go to volume motion, volume limits, and this is the size of the bounding box. So you can see as I change the size of it, it also changes the box size and box center. Okay, so we have this already here set up and also it changes depending on what type of geometry I plug in. So if I take, let's say, what can we take? Rubber toy. And maybe let's make this rubber toy a bit bigger. So that's my pick head. Okay, and the rubber toy, I'll make it bigger and then just plug it into the transform node. So now it's moving like that. And if I now display it, you can see my bounding box adjusted. So it's very procedural. So whatever I plug in here or I change the animation, it doesn't matter because it will adjust automatically. So let me just drop down a null here and I'll rename it to BBOX for bounding box. And this is the state that we want to use for our bounding box in the simulation. So let me select this node and Control C to copy it. It will copy the path to that node so that we don't need to write it manually. Then I will go to Autodop Network and inside the flip solver under volume motion, volume limits, I will adjust the box size and box center. But how can I link it to our bounding box from the sub level, from the geometry? Well, we'll use those two amazing functions that I now use very often. And this is Centroid and also BBOX bounding box expression. So the bounding box BBOX expression will return one of the things listed over here, which are minimum position in X, Y or Z axis, maximum position in X, Y or Z, and the difference between them, so the size in X, Y or Z. In order to make it work, we need to provide two things. First, the path to the node we want to read the information from, and the information we want to read, so minimum, maximum or size for each axis. So we'll do that first. So in the box size, I'll type BBOX and then open brackets and you'll get this nice guide here just to remind you what you can use. So first of all, we need to search this uh, surface node path. So let's paste the path that we copied over here. Make sure it's in reverse commas, okay? And now we'll use the X size. So we need to type D underscore X size, which will return the size of our box in X axis. So let's just type it and then we'll see X size and close the brackets and enter. Okay, so now we can see it's 7.9. It also resized here. And if I go to my example, to my bounding box and I go to the information, you can see that the size in X axis is 7.9. So exactly the same. We also have other information, the same information that we can reference with the bounding box function. So we have minimum in X, then maximum in X, size in X, and the same for Y and Z axes. So let me go back to the simulation. And now let's do the same for X and Y axis. So I can just copy all of this, press tab to go to the second tab. And then here I will type Y size. Here we go. So now it's 8.7. And then in the last one, this will be our Z size. So let's just try to remember 7, 8 and 10, just so that we can check roughly. 7, 8, 10. Here we go. So now the second thing we want to do is use the centroid expression. And the centroid expression works very similar to the bounding box. We'll also use the path. We'll use the centroid name of the function and then the command or the thing that we want to reference here. So we can either reference dx, dy or dz, which will be that centroid in x, y and z axis. 
So let's go back to Houdini. Let's go back to our DOP network. And in here, let's type Centroid, open brackets. And again, you'll get this nice guide over here. And of course, I want to have this path here. So the path to our bounding box node. And then D underscore X. Let's copy that. Okay, then in Y axis, D underscore Y. All right, and Z axis, D underscore Z. So now it's 0 0.04. Let's check. 0 0.04. Here we go. Exactly the same. So that's great. You can see the bounding box is adjusted. And now if I go to my example and let's say I want to increase the padding. Okay, let's go back to the simulation. It also increased the size of this bounding box over here. If I change my geometry, you can see it adjusted the bounding box. So now I can just save the setup, use it everywhere where I need to. So the trail, the time shift and the bound, and it will work in all scenarios. Let's have a look at one more example of how we can use the BBOX and Centroid functions. I adjusted our setup just a bit. So we still have the pick head that is moving. And then I also have this small rubber toy. It's not moving. And I have this big rubber toy that is moving a lot. And you can see also the bounding box is changing accordingly because our setup is procedural. So it doesn't matter what I plug in, our bounding box will always be correct. So now I'll go to the first frame and jump inside our simulation. And I want to use, let's use the pop axis force. Okay, so because a flip simulation works well with pop forces, we can use it here and we'll plug it into the second input particle velocity. All right, so once you plug it in, you can see this sphere in our viewport, the red sphere. And this is the visualization of our force. So the particles coming from this rubber toy will try to orbit around that sphere. But at the moment, it's quite small. So what we need to do is just increase the radius and we can increase the height. Okay, so that's great. But then when we change our inputs, the size of this box will change as well. So every time we plug something new, we'll need to adjust the radius, the height, as well as the center, because maybe we want this to be exactly in the center of the bounding box, or maybe we want it to follow up our rubber toy. So instead of adjusting it manually, we want to use the BBOX and Centroid functions. So for the center, first we need to choose the geometry. So we can either use our geometry itself, or we can use the bounding box, the center of the bounding box. So for this example, I will use the center of the bounding box. So I will actually go into flip solver and copy our box center function. So again, centroid, then the node we want to reference and then the axis. So DX, which is center in X axis. Okay, so let's go to the pop axis force and let's paste our function here. So centroid, in X axis, then in Y axis, and then in Z axis. All right, cool. So now it's in the center of our boundary box. And let's check if I change it to, let's say, input zero. Here we go. It's still in the center, so it works very well. For the radius, we can choose, for example, the X size. So again, I will go to the flip solver and let's use the bounding box size in X axis. So I'll just copy that and paste it in the radius. Here we go. And for the height, so you can see the difference is not that big because I set it to 10. But if I delete channel and revert back to default, okay, you can see that's the default value one. So when I paste our BBOX function, it changes to 10.0002. And for the height, we want the same but this time we want to change to the Y axis because it's the height. Cool. So now again, let's double check it. If I change it to a different input, it's changed as well. So it's resized for us. So now let me just maybe increase the particle separation. So it's a bit faster and let's bypass the gravity. And now let's play it.
Okay, so you can see the particles follow the pop axis force, but I want to go to the speed tab and let's increase the orbit speed maybe to five and suction speed to one and let's play it again so that we can see the impact a bit more. Okay, and just for the sanity sake, let's run it on a different example. So for this one, let's put 0 0.15. Here we go. And you can see this works as well. So you can see how versatile the bounding box and centroid functions are. We'll mostly use them for simulations. Well, I mostly use them for simulations, but of course they can be used in multiple scenarios. And that's it guys, we looked at two VEX functions, BBOX and Centroid, as well as several additional nodes that are extremely useful for bounding boxes, trail, time shift, and bounce off. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.